to prison, hopefully, for, for life. Just for those who uh, are worried about time, we'll finish by, we'll finish by uh, 12. Uh, we'll open it out to a conversation uh, so people can ask Matt whatever they, they like uh, as quickly as possible. Um, it's about to be played by Stephen Graham uh, on, uh, on TV. Um, I could really see the likeness. Um, it's in the accent. It's in the accent, is it? Yeah, but nonetheless, no yeah. on me at all, none at all. That's right. The the walk in a, a an ITV One drama so six parter, five part, five parter. There we are. Like I've already inflated as a journalist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> begins on uh, begin, begins on Monday, uh, Monday, the, Monday the third of October on ITV nine o'clock. Yeah, other channels are available for other programs on that night. But uh, there we are. But um, Matt, just tell us a bit of, for those who don't know. Yeah. Uh, the you know the the, the kernel of the uh, story. Well, um, National Action were outlawed at the end of 2016. Amber, Amber Rudd, who was the then Home Secretary, uh, outlawed the group, and uh, people did complain at the time that you'd probably send them underground. But what became clear was that they'd, they'd already been underground anyway, and that very little was known about National Action, what it believed, uh, what its activities were. And at the time, us at Hope Not Hate were sort of very skeptical that they would you know that they would just disband but the the security services were of the impression that they had disbanded that they had done as they were asked and they were no longer of a, of a risk and I kept prodding and I kept uh, investigating national action until uh, early in the early in the year in 2017 a young man uh, Robbie Mullen contacted me and said you're right the national action is still active um, and you really haven't got a clue how active we are and it you know it turned out they opened a headquarters and a gym they had a leader that we'd never heard of that the security services had never heard of and so I was very I was very excited about this because that meant I'd be able to run someone in this organization and it would be eventually a sexy story might get picked up by the the nationals and it was all going very very well um, and until one one, I, was on, I was on holiday, it was the one time I acquiesced, I said to my missus, okay, I'll go on holiday with you and the kids if you really want. <laughs> and um, we'd been there two days and I was thinking, this is absolute torture. <laughs> and, the, and then I got the, for, for, for the kids, <laughs> they, they kept saying, Daddy, put some sun cream on. I'm saying, it's not sun cream, I need. Um, and uh, I, got, I got a phone call from, from Robbie. I got a message, ring me urgently. And I, I rang him and he said uh, that they're going to kill an MP. And I said, really? And he said, yes. And I could see my missus in the other room. And she, she was thinking, here we go, here we go. One of your little Nazi friends hasn't got any toilet roll and needs you to get it for them. And I said, well, this is a bit serious, isn't it? And so then that holiday uh, was obviously ruined. But the, obviously, um, she's never asked to go on holiday with me again since. So there's a flip side. But the, um, but, but the upshot of it was, it, it was going, I think Rosie Cooper, who was the, the MP in question she was two maybe three days depending on what sort of luck Renshaw had on his side but two to three days from being beheaded being murdered outside her, her surgery and also which we don't often talk about but there was also uh, sorry yeah okay and and there was also as well as the MP the, uh, this individual Jack Renshaw wanted to target a police officer there was a, a woman police officer uh, Nazism fashion Fascists always target women, and this particular police officer was investigating him for child sexual exploitation. He'd been uh, trying to coerce children to have sex with him, and this is what we think tipped him over. Really, was the idea that rather than being known and shamed as a sex offender, because we all know the far right continually campaign against uh, child sexual exploitation, um, that he would rather be known as a what they call what he what they termed a white jihadist. So he was prepared to kill his local MP rather than known as a sex offender and so that's the the opening part of the, uh, the, the story really it's that it was good to run a mole but it, I mean the real hero is Robbie of course because um, you know I, I get paid for doing this and, and, and Robbie was just someone volunteering information 
over a pizza once a week in, in secrecy. And of course, he had to make that decision. You know, I don't think he realized at the time how both of our lives would change so you know, drastically and dramatically. But that's the crux of what happened. What, what do we learn, Matt, about how the far right operates and who it targets and, draw, and draws in in the case of, uh, in the case of Robbie, uh, a, an alienated young man, I a lot going on in his life? Yeah, I think um, it's, it, it is as it looks. A lot of the, the far right is, is obviously completely dominated by single white males, angry white males. Um, and the, I mean, I don't like now anymore going around just continually criticizing them for these issues. I think it's quite easy to understand what the far right offers people who are, uh, like Robbie says, he felt alienated from society. He didn't actually understand what his part or what his place was in society. And so straight away, he, he felt alienated from it. Like a lot of young young men as well, he had a, there was issues, that, you know, like a, what your shrink would say, there was a deep sorrow in his life. He'd lost his father and he felt he'd lost his father uh, unjustly, unfairly. And he had a, a number of these issues, which is a burning anger. And so, although we, we're constantly out campaigning against the far right, but the, the, the fact of the matter is, Robbie, and similar to my, my story myself, is I wasn't hoodwinked into getting involved in the extreme far right. For me, it just felt like, and this is the issue we have to really tackle, it just seems like the most obvious place I should be. Feeling the way I do, looking the way I do, feel, feeling about that, feeling misunderstood. These are the, you know, and, and for Robbie, as, as it was for myself years and years before, this is this is the perfect place for me. And so I don't, we, we talk a lot about how active the, the far right are, and, and that, that is the key. It's not so much, the far right isn't particularly dangerous when it's larger. It's, the far right is a danger. As soon as it's active, it's about violence. And so in Robbie's case, he saw national action, which was different than any other far right group we'd ever seen in this country. The, nat you know, the natural consequence of that politics or that political thinking and the natural consequence of things that made him sorrow or made him angry, uh, angry was violence. You know, it's a constant, th these organizations can only function violently. And we, we had previously to that, we had the National Front, we had the BNP, thing, uh, organizations we could uh, defeat electorally. With National Action, what was different, they had absolutely no interest in winning power. You know, this tiny little tin pot parties like Britain First, talking about when we come to power, we're going to do this and, and do that. This was an organization that had absolutely no interest in politics and totally decided there was absolutely no reason to politically campaign. And the, our modus operandi is to, is, is to affect change in society through violence. And that, you know, and a lot of people, the security services as well for a while, failed to understand that's what they... That's what we were dealing with. And they were underground, they were dangerous, and they were training for it. It was, you know, the, the, the dedication that they put into national action in terms of its graphics, its recruitment, uh, building offices and training people in gyms, getting people qualified in mixed martial arts, it was absolutely extraordinary. So never mind that it was banned or the fear that it was going to be underground. What we uncovered about national action was an extraordinary network of people and individuals totally hidden from society. At Hope Not Hate, we knew just about every far-right activist in the country, and we knew hardly anyone in National Action. They hadn't come through the BNP, they hadn't come through the National Front, they had come straight offline and straight into these little groups, these little pods online, and it, you know, it opened our eyes as well. It changed, for us, the way that we do things has, has changed forever, how we thought we knew and understood the far-right. When National Action was exposed and opened up, the, you know, the depths in which it sunk itself into society, partly because of the, the new modern age, but you know, both in the UK and, and America and Australia, whole networks that we were previously unaware of. If the security services had thought they'd gone away, you, you're unaware of them, you uncover them, you see the structures, you know the people uh, that, are, that are in there, how violent they are, yeah. they're fat there planning uh, to assassinate a, a politician, planning to ass assassinate a police officer. Yeah. When you go to the police and the security services, uh, how do they respond? Do they thank you? Well, I think you know the answer to that one. That was a leading question. I um, think it would have been said in court. I, uh, <laughs> the, the, there was a defence um, that 
Previously, you could... Look, I've met terrorists before. I've went and interviewed the head of the UDA and, and the UVF, and they're illegal, they're illegal organisations, and I've written about interviewing them, meeting them. I've never been arrested for it on the way back from Belfast. When I, I sent Nick Lowell to talk to the police, because obviously I was having a difficult holiday with the family, um, and Nick went and reported uh, there's this murder plot, and so Rosie Cooper was uh, taken uh, care of and, and, and cared for. And then the police immediately turned their attention on us and said, you've broken the law, tell us everything you know. And Nick was in Parliament saying, well, I don't really know other than, you know, she was going to get killed, I've told you all that I know. And they were saying to Nick, then you need to hand over this person who told you that. And this is, where, this is when we're good at what we do, because we said, no, you've saved the MP's life. Um, we realise we have to hand this, this boy over to you, but we'd like him to have immunity from prosecution. And the police laughed and said, listen, you're going to prison, never mind this boy. And they were, they were, deadly, they were deadly serious about this. And that, because I must also, of course, thank our, our solicitors, Thompson's, who you've all seen advertised around here, Thompson's Law. I didn't know what sort of law they did. So, and I, I rang them up and said, I've got a legal problem. And Steve Cavalier, as it was at the time, said, of course you have, Matthew. What, what have you done now? <laughs> And I had, to, I had to meet him in a field in Dorset because Toll Puddle was on it. And I said, I've uncovered this terrorist plot and we're hiding this boy from the police. And he said, oh, oh, say no more, say no more. And I thought he was actually going to run off and leave me. And he gave us the number. Thompson's gave us uh, a solicitor in the Newcastle office. And one of the things he said after he'd first met the police to do these negotiations on behalf of uh, Robbie Mullen, I've never seen the police behave so badly. And we put, and because also what I should point out as well is two days before we uncovered the murder plot, the security services had told the, the new Home Secretary that national action was finished. So obviously they were, they were very distressed uh, with, with the murder plot and what, and what, we'd, un, and what we'd uncovered. So uh, the parliamentary police and it went straight to counter-terrorism, uh, counter-terrorism command in London. And they, the police have, the counter-terrorism police have never spoken to me about anything. I've been stopped at airports leaving the country and arriving in other countries. They've completely refused to ever talk to me, which is good. Um, and they, hope not hate, CEO occasionally gets an angry phone call from them. But, um, yeah, they, the, I think the police were embarrassed. I think they were shocked. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is they never thanked Robbie Mullen either. Never thanked him. Never said, well done for, for saving someone's life. Do you think they've uh, learned any lessons on how they handled the case, if you, God forbid, were to uncover another well, plot? Uh, um, if I uncovered another plot, they'd be really pissed off for me, wouldn't they? <laughs> it would be worse than going after that holiday with misses. <laughs> um, I, I would say this, in 2018, the monitoring of the extreme far-right moved to the proper, like to MI5, and one of the things I, I said in an interview earlier this week was that credit to them, the issue that I think the police had in investigating the far right was that they didn't take it particularly seriously. The, uh, you know, generally spotty, skinny, white, angry boys don't look like terrorists. They look like a nuisance on the internet, which more often than not they are. And what we've noticed is that the security services are able to take a, a better forensic dip into the far right, whereas the police didn't always want to because the, the far right's often been just seen as a nuisance, isn't it? It's a, a disturbance in town centres, not really a, a terror threat. Prior to, I think, the national action case and, and the subsequent uh, convictions there have been of extreme far right terrorists, um, I have the impression that the police were basically thought they were just looking for EDL-style drunken hooligans. That it was more, it was more about a anti-social order, yeah, an anti-social behaviour as opposed to a terror threat. Since it's moved to the security services, touch wood, uh, we haven't had the spectacular terror attack that the far right desperately wants. I, I would say they've been, they've been very, very active on it. Yeah. Um, I think, again, basically because um, understanding the far right now is a lot different than it was ten years ago in this hall we were talking about defeating the BNP at the ballot box. I think the police didn't realise as well that it has changed its, its nature, its goals, its ideas, its structures. So, thankfully, I think MI5 or MI6, whoever's doing it, are doing a reasonably good job. What, what do you think the likelihood is of uh, you know, fascist Nazis plotting now in a group similar like 
national action that we haven't uncovered, you haven't uncovered, not me, uh, you, haven't, you haven't yet uncovered or detected. It, it, they're not all likely to have gone away and bought no. Lego to play with no. in the bedrooms, are they? Well, you know what boys do with Lego as well, don't you? Oh, no. Go to any A&E and you'll see what boys do with Lego. All oh, right. Um, <laughs> the... We probably won't get another organisation like National Action because that's been broken. That model, that was a new model, a new way of organising for terror for them. So we're not likely to see a group structure. But the people who were around then, those who aren't in prison, and the ideas remain. They're still prevalent. People are still discussing the ideas, the aims, the, the uh, ideologies called white jihad. The idea about looking for a spiritualism. So they've moved away as well from this idea about just praising Hitler and loving Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. They've realised in some of the, the new ideologies that they had to they had to advance their their ideas. So they had to look for a, a new spirituality because national action looked at, let's say like Jihadi John or English-born Muslims who had gone off to gone off to fight in the in, in the Middle East and the Far East, and they they said. Well, why can we not inspire our boys to do similar things? And so they looked for a new spiritualism, and we've seen it in, in uh, Satanism. We've seen it through some of the new ideas that have come out from the American far right, an increase in the idea about uh, sexual violence against your opponents, the idea about how to desensitize yourself by using uh, pedophilia. So we've seen all, all of these things, all these tenets which are all, you know, part of the, uh, the new ideologies around the far right. We're still seeing evidence of all these things. We're picking these things up on the internet, in their secret chat rooms, or even in meetings around the country. But th this idea hasn't gone away. This will and this desire hasn't, hasn't gone away. We won't see another organization like National Action. But what we are seeing, and we have seen since uh, 2017, is the uh, extension of, of, those, of those ideas. So I don't make forecasts. You certainly shouldn't make forecasts in terms, of, in terms of terrorism. But certainly, that terror threat hasn't gone away. And certainly, their desires for it, in terms of there's absolutely no chance of them having any electoral breakthroughs at the moment at all. There's no road, there's no road to power for them. All that is left for them is this continual planning for terror. Just before um, I open it up in a, a, a con <coughs> wider conversation, just the, the, um, what was the impact of this case on three people, starting with, with Robbie Mullen? Uh, I, I can't speak for, for Robbie personally, but uh, Ros and I had breakfast with him yesterday. He's just, for a very, very short time, a very, very I think confused, uh, angry young man had a group of friends that for him meant the world. National action meant the world to him. Every day, every thought, every every moment, every phone call was about his friends in national action. And we, we ripped that apart from him. We ripped it out of him. He did the right thing because he realized that they were moving towards terrorism and he didn't want anybody to die. But, uh, you know, he's still a decent young man, but he's still got things to work through and he's thrust in, he's been thrust into the spotlight one of the things that you see in the, the walk-in is where he just says i don't want to be a poster boy i just don't want to be your poster boy i don't want to go to conferences i don't want to do anti-racist meetings i want to walk my dog and i want to play playstation and you know what at the end of the day i, I forget how old he is now if that's what he wants to do and with what he's done, then that's fine by me. Mm -hmm. And what about Rosie Cooper? How's your relationship with, uh, given that you were you know, pretty crucial in saving her life? I think, well, Rosie, uh, the day they announced the walk-in was coming out, Rosie said she was leaving Parliament. I mean, it had a, of course, had a profound effect on her. I don't think she understood why, other than the fact that she was a woman and she was local, is the only reason she was chosen. I mean, that was... You know, her, her bad luck, but you know, she's, she's left Parliament now, she's got, she's got a new job, and obviously it's had a profound effect on her about the way, and all MPs really, you know, since Joe Cox, I think we, everyone's been really concerned about MP security, but are we doing enough about it? Uh, so, yeah, I hope Rosie Cooper, she, she's happy, she's done her time as an MP, and she's got a new, a new job now, and hopefully she can put it behind her. And what about you, yourself? It's a hell of a pressure from... Uh... Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't easy. But I've, I've done this. I'm giving. I know. I look. I know. I look about 29. But, I, but I've been doing this 30 something years in one way or form, either as a fascist and an undercover mole, and then working as an anti-fascist. I've seen all kinds of things, extraordinary, and I've taken part in. No point denying it. Awful things I did. 
Um, but when you when you come across these secret messages where they're talking about hunting down your mother and raping her to teach you a lesson, mm. and then you've got to go and tell your mum that, or when the police knock on your door and say there's a credible threat to your children, and then you just sort of that made yeah for me the move in the house, the extra security. We, we, we've always had security. Mm. But the, like, like their politics has changed, the rules has changed. When I was a Nazi with like John Tyndall, now, you, he would never have thought about going around and raping someone's children or mother. But these are the sort of people we, we're, we're dealing with now. And then having to tell your mum that, um, she took it quite well, actually. <laughs> she, she hasn't spoke to me since. But, um, but uh, yeah. Just things you'd never thought you'd have to do. What a thing to tell your mother. And do I believe they would have done it? Yeah. Well, yeah, we know they were going to do it. Mm. Yeah. And you were attacked on the... I've been beaten up so many times. Yeah. I've got three brothers, you know. But, um, yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been attacked lot, lots of times. I had my teeth knocked out a few years ago, which was a result, because the dentist wanted to charge about 650 quid. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had to have some new, some new teeth put in at the, at the front. And it is difficult, because I suffer anxiety now. I don't like going out into big crowds. Mm. You'd know that, being a Sunderland fan. Oh, 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 oh. How that feels. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, oh, oh. Right, hey. oh, there's two of them, there's two of them. <laughs> no wonder the game was empty last night. <laughs> You're both here. Um, no, I don't, I don't like going out into big crowds. I don't particularly like speaking at meetings, mm. really. It's, um, it's noticeable. I think my children notice there's... I mean, they're still very young, but they notice there has been a change, particularly at, at home. Mm and not going out and stuff like that. Well, we're pleased you're here today. Thank you, thank yeah. you. Did I you mention I've got a book coming out? Yeah, I was about to mention you've got a book. I don't think anyone could miss you've got a book uh, coming out. And uh, rare unsigned copies will be available at some point. I'm, uh, <laughs> I sign them all. I'm sure, yeah. Have you signed your Nazi terrorist ones? Uh, yeah. You haven't? Yeah, no. These are not unsigned. So I'll have them signed a, before you will leave. It's a good read, that. Uh, but no, but the, the walking... Accompanying book with a yep. TV series will uh, be. Yeah, no, I should just say, in fairness, the the walk-in uh, that I've written here was written after the program was done and filmed. Um, ITV wrote the film. I just wrote the book to go with it, which uh, just tells a little bit more about some of the ridiculous things I've done. It's quite it's a good read, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, good read, the author. Yeah, 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 yeah I didn't say that either, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I had to write the foreword for Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to translate it into English. Yeah, no. <laughs> All right. Anyway, you can get it from the Hope Not Hate online shop, and I'll sign it if you're desperate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm very happy. If, if anyone uh, anyone would like to ask, uh, uh, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, for the recording, yeah. Uh, I don't normally use a mic. Um, you mentioned that uh, you know there's little chance of electoral success yeah. in the UK. However, what you see in, in Europe, with the rise of, of far-right and nationalistic type policy, uh, uh, parties, that's why we did Brexit, though, wouldn't it, to get away from all that? <laughs> do you think? Do you think with that that's going to embolden the far-right groups in the in 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 the UK, and because they don't have that avenue of, of political success? that actually that's going to lead to more and more violence or threats of violence? Yeah, I think, I think more and more violence we, we are seeing. And again, we don't, don't judge the far right on its size or electoral capabilities, but by its nature, it's violent. In terms of like things, like certain countries in Europe have a culture, a, a culture of fascism. It's existed in their political ideas for you know, more than a century or centuries even. We never really, never, never really had that here. Um, I think it will. I think it will embolden him. I saw Tommy Robinson was very, very happy with the results in Italy, and he said, "Let that be a lesson to all of us here." What we have in this country is, of course, a, a current government that uses much of the language that the far right does anyway, and that's you know that's their problem. I mean, it's our problem, but it's also the far the far right's problem. We saw it with when the BNP went into electoral decline, how UKIP took much of that. BNP vote. It was a million votes worth having for UKIP. And then the UKIP went from being a sort of a right party to a far right party. And then when UKIP grew and it was taking Labour and Tory votes, we saw the Tory party swing further to the right. And so like, we seem to have an electoral system here where people will always, cha will always chase what the popular vote is across Europe. I can't see our, government, our current government 
getting any more extreme to the right. They're just because of, because of our Conservative Party, there's just no space for the extreme far right in our electoral in our electoral system. Rwanda is a policy that a far right party could have uh, could have invented. A far right party did invent it. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, mentioned Tommy there, uh, didn't you? Uh, oh yes, Yaxley, uh, Yaxley or Stephen Yaxley Lennon. I think he's dropped the Yaxley anyway. But uh, there's also a flyer for uh, for a book by your colleague Nick Nick Lowell's. Nick Lowell's uh, has a book on, on Tommy Robinson coming out. Tommy oh. Robinson's not happy about that. No, well, that's, that's always a, that's always a, a, a pleasure. He's unhappy, but he, he of course, as uh, you mentioned him, he is somebody else who is, uses very intimidating uh, tactics yeah. and those well, around him. And we, 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 violence and we gangsterism. Try, we, we try to have these conversations with the NUJ sometimes. I know it's very difficult. People like Tommy Robinson and others who just run around the country and calling themselves reporters and journalists. Mm. And we, on, on, sometimes on demonstrations you find there's far-right activists in there who have just told the police, I'm a journalist. And uh, you say, well, what, what kind of journalism is it? And he says, I've got 5,000 followers on Facebook. Mm. Um, Lennon is, you know, he... The research he does and documentaries he makes, he seems to think that that's main, you know, these things are mainstream issues. Um, he's, he's problematic, but there's lots of others. We have a lot of people now who aren't interested in politics. Stephen Lennon's never stood for election. Most popular far-right figure in the country. He's never actually put it to the test. He's never gone to an electorate. Not interested in it. They are, their whole idea is about influence, I think, influence and policy. And again, I think they had, they had some effect on that with some of their ideas particularly how the Conservative government responds to challenges on immigration or challenges of, of, of migration. And they don't, you know, they don't respond very well to them. Didn't he stand in North West in the last year? Oh, of course he did, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, Kevin. All right, sorry, I hate to correct you. Thought, you. Thought, no, <laughs> I was on holiday that week. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, with a family. And I, yeah, with a family. And, I, yeah, I, and he got pulled up, didn't he, because he was giving people free sausages. He had a barbecue. <laughs> Free pork sausages, and then the electoral commission turned up and said, "You can't do that." And it was like, "Oh, typical. We're like a communist country. You can't even give out a few pork sausages." No, he did stand. You're right. Apologies. And lost. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So our colleague, female colleague in the back corner. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for that. That's very interesting. That's very interesting, but. It's, it's, it reminds me of all the de debates on the left in the 60s. There's not a mention of women. I want to know what the... Uh, I want to know about Rosie Cooper, what effect it had on her, and, of course, Joe Cox, who was killed. Maybe and what are the gender dimensions? I mean, where are the women in this story? Is there... They're not here... I can't... Is there any role for us at all in, in this whole saga? I mean, is it... Are they, these men rescuable? This this group. Are there any women in these these um, these groups? Yep. I mean, there's a woman leader in in Italy now, far right. Although yep. she doesn't sound as far right actually. Perhaps as, maybe she. You know, we thought she was. But you know, I'd like to know about a bit more about that. I don't want to be put. I don't want to criticise. But there is a big gap in this story. Yep. Yep. Well, we had a. Uh a leader of a far-right party in this country till two months ago, uh, and Anne-Marie Waters, or uh, that's her anglicised name, her real name was Anna Maria Waters, and she led a party that was closely linked with Stephen Lennon, and she said, she said herself that there, you know, there's just no appetite in this country for electoral politics. Um, in terms of the role of women in the far right, when we saw the rise of the English Defence League, the EDL, we'd never seen so many women active on the far right, and I think Early on in the EDL, probably about 20% of their activists were female. It was extraordinary. It was, it was, was frightening. In terms of the... One of the things we, we noticed or has been noticed was that women's effect on far-right activism tends to be women have a calmer influence on them. In terms of tackling uh, hate messaging, we found that uh, women, are, women respond better to positive messages and women are the sort of the barometer by which, is it barometer is the word I'm looking for? Uh, yep. Women have a better effect on society in terms of uh, dealing with hatred. Women are the first to object to hate language. Women are the first to pick up hate language. Uh, one of the things, of course, uh, is, is that in some of these more extreme far-right groups, of course, are, are, these, are these men who are... Um, uh, extremely and dangerously misog misogynistic 
who hold extreme, really violent, dangerous views towards women, mainly because I think it stems from a loneliness, isn't it? Their hatred of what they can't have and what they can't do. But the, the women's part in combat in the far right is, of course, that we, as anti-fascists, of course, we, we want women to be uh, right, at the, right at the front of doing this and, and understanding it and leading, and leading the way. And it's also, in, the broader and broader, in a wider and broader society, is encouraging women to find those voices to speak up against it. Because too, there's too many times in, in society women aren't listened to, and often, as we found when we've done research, it's women, it's women in the home who are the first to object to racist language. It's women in the home who are the first to object to hateful, hateful behaviour. So, you know, the better place women are in society, and of course there's still a long way to go in that, but the better place women are in society is generally better for the mood in society, as I, as I see it. I hope that makes sense. Mm. Oh, please, and then we'll come down here. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Martin Timpson. I'm from Liverpool Riverside CLP, which is the home constituency where you are. So, hope everyone's having a great mm -hmm. conference and uh, welcome. <laughs> uh, thanks. You get I just... a clap for that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Uh, I just wanted to thank and praise Hope Not Hate for the very important and very beneficial work it does, um, and we see the power of it here locally, and I'm sure um, other. Um, town, cities, communities do also. Um, recently, um, Hope Not Hate led a campaign um, to shut down a Nazi gig which was planned in the town of Witness, which was within Liverpool city region. As you can imagine, um, we were all very disturbed by the thought of uh, a vile fascist gig happening. Um, and Hope Not Hate gave a lead and brought the uh, community together in witness, yes. most importantly of all, but also um, you know, across Liverpool City region and further afield. I also just wanted to um, thank and praise uh, yourself, Matthew, and people like the late and great Ray Hill, yeah. uh, people who um, have rejected racism and fascism in their own lives um, and have very um, you know, bravely um, become great anti-racists and anti-fascists because you're a real living example uh, to people that they can um, reject hate and evil and come good. So thanks to Hope Not Hate and Thank uh, thanks to yourself, Matthew, and the late great Ray Hill. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, did you ever just think of having a, a quiet life after, you know, you... You know, you, you saw the error of your ways as a young man. You know, when I you were I, alienated. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't have thought 30 years ago I would end up here mm. doing this. But um, for the better, I think, in the long term. I mean, it's been a bit rough in, in places and times. But no. I, I, the, the other thing is, I do remember, because I joined the National Front in 1987. Can you imagine? It was like eight people. You know. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, I sort of thought if I hadn't have done that, then I probably would have joined the BNP in the 90s and the noughties when it was strong, and then I probably would have joined the EDL. I think it was just, you know, I was attracted to that sort of, that sort of politics. I, I, mm. uh, working it out now, I mean, I hope not hate does education work mm. with young people. And I think a lot of people refuse to understand how attractive these things are. The first way in defeating it is realise it's attractive, you know, and it's, it, like everything, it's addictive. Yeah. And... Um, Robbie was addicted to it, yeah. environmentally, socially, culturally, I was addicted to it, so, mm -hmm. but um, i got other addictions now, anyway. So. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you can get your help. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm sure the far right hate you now, because you, you, you do give hope. They don't like uh, me. Please. Thank you. Um, I have two questions for May. First one, it seems to me that a lot of the rad like, radicalisation now comes from online forums. Yeah. Um, I'm probably not the only one who was terrified by the, the, the Donald Trump rally where all of the crowd were doing that uh, QAnon symbol with their finger and yes. the, kind of the, the legitimacy of it now in yep. America. Um, so my question is, in terms of that, how can the legislation or the government crack down on these social media companies that have allowed it to foster? Um, I remember Ken McCallum, the Director General of MO5, talking around kind of the entering encryption and how they're trying to change that so that it's harder to actually kind of keep track of these messages. Is there anything that genuinely can be done? I know the online safety bills now up in the air, etc. Um, and then second question for me, I know that Suella Braveman has 
come out against the Prevent programme uh, and said that it's focusing too much on right-wing extremism, which is uh, much a joke as Suella Braven being our Home Secretary. But um, are we going to continue to go backwards in counter-terrorism as long as people like this are in government? Thank you. Well, yeah. I hope I are doing some work on the online safety bill. I don't know if they did it here at this conference. Was they, they did? Everyone knows but me. Um, <laughs> and, and, head of intelligence. Yeah, sometimes that's an oxymoron. Um, and they've made submissions to it. The, the internet is just so full of really awful conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists. You know, and America had one as its president. Yeah. So uh, that's the extent of the pro that's the extent of the problem. Uh, in terms of prevent program, I remember years ago working with a Muslim colleague, and I asked him what he thought about prevent, and he said we call it provoke. And um, I thought that's a bit extreme, and it t it, it does turn out I think is prevent is problematic. I think I remember. Oh, I think I know that the the day after the Brexit uh, result came in. Lots of little boys up and down the country were uh, referred to prevent for saying things like "we're taking our country back," blah 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 blah, and that's actually true. And they were they were sent to prevent for it because they were deemed to be extremists. But the fact of the matter was that was the narrative. And if we have if we have a government overseeing the prevent agenda, but much of what people are uh, criticised for saying or criticised for doing, it, 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 you know, it's led from the top. We, have a, we should send this government to prevent, really, shouldn't we? But I don't think the prevent is fit for purpose. I know that the Daily, uh, the, the Times, Fiona Hamilton at the Times, a couple of years ago did a fantastic takedown on prevent. It's, it's problematic. I think it's really, really problematic. What about the point that uh, it should focus less on the far right? Well, I think the I think the issue is I, I sort of tended to touch to touch on it there is in terms of calling it provoke is that I think a lot of um, young boys are sent on prevent for saying things that perhaps people don't understand. We have to have a discourse. We have to have some radical thought in society. Otherwise, otherwise nothing changes. Um, the the look prevent should be focused on stopping people getting killed. Prevent should be stop. People should be focused on stopping people going to bed in, in fear at night. It should be focused on stopping people getting attacked at work. So it's not about too much far right, is it? It's about too much hate. Focus on the hatred wherever it's coming from. Hope that hate aren't in the business of you know comparing apples and oranges. It's about wherever there is hatred, wherever there is the fear of you know people. The, the problem of people acting out violently. Focus on it. Why, what is the point of just saying, oh, there's too much of this and not enough of that? The whole thing is a problem. The whole narrative around hatred and violence and terrorism, wherever it comes from. Why, why does our government see one, you know, th this isn't so bad? Because, what, we share some views or we share some values with these people? So I reject that notion. <laughs> Thank you. Is that all right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Thomas Tyler. Um, I have a couple of friends who are involved in uh, scholarship around uh, the far right. I've done little bits of reading myself. Something that I've come across that I found very interesting was the sort of uh, discussion of uh, what I've seen sort of called the sort of three main prongs of uh, the modern far right. Uh, what sometimes gets called the extreme right, who are people like the National Action who reject any kind of part of civil society. Um, the radical right, um, who will engage in political activism and uh, democracy, but only with the intention of ultimately undermining it. And the sort of capture of the mainstream right and the um, uh, mainstreaming of uh, far right views, talking points, and even figures through parties like uh, the Republicans in the US and uh, the Tories here, and that these things all present very different sort of threat profiles um, and need to be dealt with differently. And I was wondering if you had uh, any particular thoughts on that. What well, now? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, it is interesting. There's a, there's a lot of research that continues to come out about what is the threat, where does the threat come from, where should we where should we be looking from? In terms of what I do, I, I, I'm more worried about the end product. 
but I do, but I do see it. there are there are threads and strands of extreme right behaviour. But I do, I, there's no reason to suggest that there's not like, like an osmosis that you know people will only follow one one course. The thing, like with anything that's extreme, that you're right about taking part in, for instance, democratic behaviour or civil society only in the in the sense to undermine it. But I think again. Like with, like with everything else, there's just continual, continual strands of, it, of of everything. One of the one of the questions I got asked the other day was, would it have been better if the if the BNP had had a couple of MPs? Would that have stopped uh, Nazi terrorists? And I said, well, no, of course it wouldn't. Of course it wasn't. But it, would it be better if they were still active? I, I I I don't know. I just think the direction that the far right has gone in is so dark and and so dangerous now that they will use by any means. And also the other thing I should point out is as well, some people, so far has this gone, this sort of Trump idea about just believe any truth you want, some people often don't even believe that they're, they're saying hateful things. This idea that you can say whatever you want, some people don't realise, does that make me far right? And you say, yes, it does. Just because you, you don't have a right to say these things. Oh, you know. But it, but it, it comes by any strands and it, you know, it, it necess necessitates itself, but the end product, of course, is, is, is unacceptable in, in a democratic civil society. I hope that helps. It's a really good question, and I just blew me off my wire. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you tackle this? Because the far, the far right, we, you, you saw, was it um, Britain First, we're using animal rights yeah. on, online. Oh, it's, you... Yeah, it, it's, but it's, it's your animal is my animal, isn't it? Mm. And, you, know, mm. um, you know, Britain First aren't suddenly become vegans. No, no, it, no, it was just and, uh, a vehicle. And, and oh. It's a vehicle, isn't it? Yeah. Because they, they use, as Mosley did, you know, to, uh, to attack Jews the, the way that animals are slaughtered, mm. and now to attack Muslims the way that animals are slaughtered. They don't give a happy toss about the, the, the health and welfare of an animal. Mm. It's just they just don't like the way other people eat it. And that's, mm. and that's basically what it was. They've, they've all, far-right groups have always tried to, have always tried to cotton on to, to popular um, campaigns or popular protests including when the Bisto mum died, you know, mm. they got two and a half million hits on their Facebook page because they said like this if you, you know, if you like her. Um, it's it's good, good question because I think one of the things is as well is that we put a lot of research and effort into understanding the appeals of the far right. And I, I've said before, I don't think, I don't think it's brain surgery, but it, how it works and and how it spreads in society. But I think one of the good things about Hope Not Hate does is as well that in terms of counter that messaging, is actually we have to remember as well that we're not cowards from fascists, we're not hiding from fascists, we don't like them. But as much as they try and dominate the internet, as much as they try and dominate all, all the debates, and you go on question time now and it looks like a bloody Nazi rally sometimes in the audience, is that we, we too can fill those spaces. We too have good arguments. We too have good ideas. We too have good things to put on Facebook. So we, yeah, I'd like to see us as, you know, as civil people. So, you know, we should make as, as much effort as possible to reclaim those spaces. We talk a lot about what the far right are doing, rightly so, and it concerns us. But also, you know, it is a competition. Hearts, minds, souls, votes. And as well as being mindful of what they're doing and being constantly alert to it. Don't forget, we have a right to fill those spaces with, with, with good messages, with positive messages. I don't want to sound like a hippie, but you know, we have good, nice things to say. We have good, nice things to do. We have good ideas about how we should live and how other people should be treated and the dignity. So even though we worry about the far right and how almost dominant it is, we can also fill those spaces ourselves. If it is a competition for hearts and minds, with the far right, are we winning or losing? Yeah, I don't make forecasts. I think if you'd have looked at this picture now, I think there's one Nazi elected in this country somewhere in some minor council. I would have said that was a fantastic victory, given where we were in 2010, right? On the cusp of maybe two BMP MPs, two BMP MEPs, almost taking control of Barkin and Dagenham Council. If you'd have given me the the sort of picture now, tiny, tiny little far-right political parties, some of them aren't even registered for elections, I would have taken that as a victory. But knowing what we know now, 12 years on from having defeated the BNP and wiped them out, that still there are people in this country who are desperate to unsettle it, who are desperate to destroy it, and are, you know, and are hell-bent, as it turns out, on murdering, maiming and killing. Um, I think we... 
probably we're going to be fighting a long draw with these people, but they'll never get over the line. I don't think they'll ever get over the line again. But what they, but their methods and you know their, their reasons now are more extreme and more dangerous. We're not fighting an electric. It's not an electoral threat. It's a, it is a terror threat. Please. Yeah. If I make it's kind of a question to both of you, because given you're a journalist, right? How much do you think that your industry is almost, in a way, complicit within this in terms of, like, for example, the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, the the, the press that's owned by predominantly uh, right-wing interests? How much do you think that they've become complicit in normalising this in terms of people's hearts and minds over spreading a similar message? over a number of years to the point that it becomes normalised on whether that's mm. immigration or race. Um, and so, yeah, kind of a question to, to both of you, and if, if you think as well, Matthew, that you've seen that as an experience in terms of how people get brought into the fold of the far right. No, I think parts of it have uh, normalised, as it, you say, by demonising refugees, people who are are different, uh, always pr uh, presenting migration in a negative way, uh, claiming sometimes you know, white guys are, you know, are under threat. Uh, you know, some commentators, some newspapers, some programmes yeah, uh, are really guilty of that. No, not directly encouraging fascism or saying back the far right, but the kind of conversation and the picture is where they will they will thrive, uh, and that needs to be challenged. We also uh, other parts have, have been very, including the mirror, have been very good at exposing it and pushing back uh, at it. But no, I think there are, there are parts of the media that uh, that are guilty, and uh, you, you could even say have blood on their hands because they are. Yeah, I agree. One of the one of the things I do, I get lots of emails from people telling me uh, things that the far right are doing. And the majority of the uh, emails are suggesting that Britain First, for instance, should be prosecuted for this article on its website or it's something. And 99% of the time, it's just Britain First to put a Daily Mail article up. And people read it and think, this is outrageous, Britain First. It's like, actually, this is a, one of the most read newspapers in the world that's published this. So the press regulates itself, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Where's your answer? Yeah, but, uh, yeah. I'm not sure regulation would, because it would be, it'd be comment is, uh, comment mm. is free. Yeah. yeah. Please. You mentioned education and positivity. Um, and I know Hope Not Hate do lots and lots of really good work in schools around education. Um, I work for the National Association of Teachers of RE. Um, I have possibly um, uh, an over-optimistic view that um, religious education, which teaches about all religions and mm. none, um, should help to educate, help people to understand a little more about the food laws that you were talking about. Am I living in my own little rosy glow, or should we carry on um, trying to do our best in this area? Carry on. Never stop. You're doing well. Carry on. Simple. Never stop. So um, let's have more positive stuff in the newspapers exactly. then. Oh, yeah. About, yeah, yeah, yeah. about <laughs> Ari in the club. What do you mean, yeah. About Ari in the club. About Ari in the club. Right. Right. Yeah. I'll chat afterwards. As long as you, yeah, you said all faiths and none, uh, as a, you know, a humanist on a good day and uh, an atheist on a bad. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's absolutely right. We, talk, we, we teach about Islam, Judaism, Christianity, non religious yeah. worldviews, yeah. including humanism. It's really important children understand it's, it's other people's worldviews. Yeah, they've got to understand other people's faiths and if you have an understanding of, uh, of Islam Buddhism you know, Jewish religion it's just got to be uh, and all the others it's got to be a good thing rather than having myths you can criticise right? in France for example with the teacher who showed a picture of Charlie Hebdo then does that something when he kills yes mm -hmm. no it's, yeah. and there's always a teacher being killed for showing him well, oh, yeah, generally, uh, intelligent and educated people don't go out killing. So education is incredibly important. Mm. Right. Anybody? Any final? Or we could uh, we could. Did, did you up. mention I've got a book out? Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just one. Believe it or not, <laughs> the walking book will be available from Tuesday. The fourth. Matt Collins uh, available all 
good booksellers. Get it from um, Hope, Hope Not Hate. Get it from Hope Not Hate. The Hope Not Hate website. Um, and also, Tommy by Nick Lowell's will be out soon about uh, uh, end of October. Stephen October. Lennon. There's going to be a battle of the books. See which one sells most. I think yeah, that's what we we'll, that's what we we'll have. But um, here's what got to be delivered first. I know, <laughs> but yeah, I know you're beating him. You're beating him to the punch. Um, yeah. But Matt, thank you so much for, my, for my coming pleasure. along and, be, and being so open uh, and, and, and very honest, uh, which I think everybody uh, appreciates. Uh, and thank you to everybody here for coming along, for listening, yes, contributing, you, thinking, you. fighting, and uh, we just keep going. It, it is. It's, we've got, we've got to not, keep on going. We're not hiding. But thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.